But we all have fears. And fears uh, can be like cholesterol, right? Uh, they can be either good or bad, right? So you get the report, yeah. So it's healthy, it's a healthy thing not, you know, to not want to parachute out of an airplane, correct? Only crazy people do that, seriously. Uh, not on my bucket list, but if that plane is on fire and is going down, a greater fear now has replaced our initial fear. So fear can be complicated, can it? You know, one thing I've always heard about in both, uh, formerly I was in sales and, and then also in ministry, it carries over. You hear that unless the, the fear of staying the same is greater than the fear of change, you'll never change until you get to that point. So you have to do that. Now, you know what? I confess, there we go. Um, I have a fear of spiders. I used to have a nightmares about spiders, and you know, Cindy would have to wake me up. I'm groaning and thrashing trying to kill these things. Now, I do not have arachnophobia. You know, I just don't like spiders. And, uh, yeah, let me take that one back one. Uh, is it going back? Yeah, thank you. This is my first reaction when I see a spider. I don't overreact. Um, but, you know, I've seen all the sci-fi movies. My brother and I would stay up late at night. You know, some of those, no Gilardi. That was, this, yeah, that goes way back before the ghoul, son of ghoul, and all of those guys. This is way, way back. We would stay up and watch these sci-fi movies and things and you know the spiders would end up eating the whole town so my job is to prevent that from happening you're welcome <laughs> death to all spiders my daughters would always say when they were young daddy there's a spider in my room so I'd go in you know tissue in hand and um and then I use the dad you know tell him the proverbial dad comment on that he won't have the guts to do that again so yeah uh, yes that is the fate of spiders in my household. And don't let people tell you, don't worry, the spider is small. So's a grenade, right? Yes, no, that's not true. Spiders are out. To do it. Now, we know the spiders, they're good. They eat insects mostly. Some of the larger ones eat lizards, birds, and small mammals. Think of that for a second. So given their abundance and the voraciousness of their appetite, two European biologists uh, decided that they were going to determine how much food a spider consumed in a year. These were men with lots of time on their hand. They said that spiders eat between 4 million and 800 million tons of prey every year. Yeah. That means spiders eat at least as much meat as all seven billion humans on earth combined. Now, if you want a little more disturbing comparison, when you take up all the biomass of adults on earth, now you see why I fear them? You know where we're headed here? That's only 287 million tons. If you throw in about 70 million more tons for kids, that's only equal to about half the food or somewhere that a spider would eat. So it doesn't even equal their total. So they could eat all of us and still be hungry. <laughs> I think about these things. Yeah. You know, spiders are, are quite literally, you know, all around us. You know, this thing about, it is a myth, though, about swallowing spiders in your sleep. That, that's not true, what they say about that. But they do watch you. And... Right now, there's probably uh, somewhere in the room a spider right now sizing you up, looking from some darkened corner, eight glistening eyes, uh, watching you, and um, that's how I keep people awake during a sermon. You know, I'll be looking underneath. <laughs> I'll be looking for that spider now. So you see why I fear spiders? That's not an irrational fear. This is a real thing. 
fears can be healthy. Let's get that creepy guy off of there. And fears can be harmful. You know, they can move into phobias and, and lead into anxiety uh, issues. Bruce Terpsa, he was the former district superintendent of the Alliance, the Metro District. He also started the Consentia Group, which does this uh, motivational survey type thing that uh, all Alliance workers have to take. But anyhow, and it deals with, deals with your, your motivations and things. He says this, living in fear is highly destructive. When fear grips our heart, or when we live in constant anxiety, our bodies shut down, our blood pressure rises, sleep is elusive, and we have a hard time focusing. Fear also impacts our relationships because we're on edge. And we overdo some of the thing, our strengths and some of the things that work for us, and we unintentionally drive others away when we're in fear and try as hard as we can to avoid the potential pain or loss is what our fallback is rather than trusting God. You know, fear not can seem so impossible for many. You know, the phrase do not fear is used 365 times in Scripture. That's like one a day. That tells us something about God's desire to see us set free from the power of fear. It also means that it is possible to stop being afraid. There is hope. So we'll tell you, we're going to look into Second Chronicles. Uh, I think I had scripture down as 20. We're going to actually start in 17. So if you can turn in your Bibles, digital device, everything to those scriptures. Second Chronicles to help you out is right after First Chronicles. So that should get you right there. And as we're getting there, let me pray for us. Father, pray today that your spirit move. You've already been here. We've felt your presence. Uh, We've felt your praise and blessing this morning. Help us, Lord, as we dive into your word, that we not just make it head knowledge, but heart knowledge. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at uh, King Jehoshaphat, uh, king of Judah. Israel and Judah have, have split into two kingdoms now. Uh, the greater king, the northern kingdom of, of Israel, southern kingdom of, of Judah. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. And he came to power at the age of 35 and reigned for about 25 years. He was one of the good kings and he followed God. In Second Chronicles 17, um, we read this uh, about Jehoshaphat. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. You know, not only did he follow after God, but we see later in this chapter, he sent out officials and priests to teach the people. You know, and because of his devotion to God, we see the results in chapter 17 and verse 10. And it says there, And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, and they made no war against Jehoshaphat. It was not the fear of Jehoshaphat, was it? But the fear of the Lord that fell upon the nations. That fear caused them to bring tribute to Judah. And Jehoshaphat grew steadily greater. You know, that's a good fear for folks to have. And he also had a vast army that was close to one million men. Do you know 
the most detestable thing about spiders? It's their web. You know, you're walking and you get into that web and it's like, and you know you're going to get attacked at any moment, you know, while they're doing it. I hate that. I hate that. Well, Jehoshaphat, he has a web moment right now. Only it's a web moment of his own making. If we look at uh, chapter 18 of 2 Chronicles, it says there, Jehoshaphat had great riches and honor, and he made a marriage alliance with Ahab. Now, if you remember, and maybe not, but Ahab is the most evil, immoral king of Israel. He has been warring with Judah for about 50 years now. Jehoshaphat married Ahab's daughter, so there would be peace between them. So I ask you, who does Jehoshaphat fear now? Even with God's favor and his mighty army, he still tries to manage his fear on his own. That's bad fear. That's getting caught in a web of your own making And we tend to do that, don't we? This unholy alliance causes Jehoshaphat and Judah to be drawn into battle with Israel against Syria. The battle doesn't go well, and Ahab, Jehoshaphat's father-in-law, is killed. Now we look down to chapter 19, verse 1. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. But Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. I don't know about you, but the wrath of the Lord is probably something to fear. You know, sidebar, isn't that salvation is what it's all about? Being saved from the wrath of God? But Jehoshaphat finds himself the target of God's wrath. But it's all not hopeless because the the prophet goes on and says, Nevertheless, some good is found in you. For you destroyed the Asherah out of the land and have set your heart to seek God. That's the grace of God, isn't it, in action there. He messed up. He dealt with this fear in his own way. He failed. But worse, it strained his relationship with God. His marriage alliance has drawn him into a partnership with the wicked. And that bond will cause issues for his heirs ongoing. The ripple effect of that consequence will continue on. You know, the thing about Jehoshaphat, though, he doesn't get angry at God's reprimand. You know, his father Asa did. Instead, he doubles down on his commitment to the Lord. Look at verse, or chapter 19, verses 4 through 7. Jehoshaphat lived at Jerusalem. See what he does? He went back and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. He appointed judges in the land and all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, said to the judges, Consider what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord. He is with you in giving judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, or partiality, or taking bribes. He went out again among the people, bringing them back to God. What is interesting here, when you you see that, is that when leadership strays, what happens to the people? They stray too. 
He had to bring them back. So as leaders, we've got a heavy responsibility to stay focused, to stay at the foot of Jesus, to be able to lead effectively. In verse 7, he says, now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. He states that again in 19, verse 9, talking to the judges and their righteous ruling on cases. And he charged them, you shall, do in the, you shall do in the fear of the Lord in faithfulness and with your whole heart. You know, that's good fear. That's reverent fear. That's the fear we want. So everything is all good again. Jehoshaphat doing all this great thing for the Lord. And then this happens. Another spider web. Look at uh, 2 Chronicles 20. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3. After this, the Moabites, Ammonites, and and with them some of the Muonites against Jehoshaphat for battle. They came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom. From beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazan Tamara, which is the Engedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. Jehoshaphat was afraid. He faced, as our outline says, the fear of impending doom. This massive army is already at his doorstep. He has no time to, mu- to mobilize militarily. He's facing impending doom. But in this case, this is good fear. You know, now when you go to the doctor's office, and as you age, you do that a lot, um, you spend half your time answering questions. You realize that? You know, they say, why are you here? What is your pain level? You know, and then they get to my favorite. Do you feel safe at home? Yeah. I tell them, I don't feel safe answering that question with my wife in the room. (laughs) Never gets old. Uh, Maybe it does. (laughs) But isn't that the reality we live in today, post-COVID world? We don't feel safe anywhere. Uh, We don't even feel safe at home. We fear what's going to happen next. And the culture and our politicians play on our fears. You know, Jehoshaphat, though even afraid, shows that his faith is genuine. It's the real deal. He prays. You know, I I wish that was my reaction, my first reaction, when facing impending doom. My first reaction is usually I say, I'm sorry, dear. So what I should do is pray and then say, I'm sorry, dear. That's, I have the order, you know, out of, out of whack there. But seriously, how do we develop such, such an attitude of prayer? Instead of fear rushing in, prayer rushes in like a first responder. I want that, but how does it happen? Well, it takes prior preparation. That's what we do. Preparation is essential. You know, some of the sports teams, football, will script out the first 12, 15 plays that the offense is going to run. They've already put them in. Whether they work or not or what they have them set up, this is what we're going to do. That's prior preparation. We need to script out things ourselves for our prayer life. It's it's essential in developing a prayer response to fears to have that preparation. Jehoshaphat did just that. You know, remember in the previous chapters how he sent out officials and priests out to teach the people to bring them back to the Lord? Jehoshaphat had prepared the people of God to be a people of prayer. Eight times in chapter 20, we read all all Jerusalem and all Jerusalem and Judah. They were all in, united in faith and prayer. So the solution when faced with the fear of impending doom as, is that we turn and implore the divine.
our preparation, our prior preparation, brings us to a position of prayer before the one who can defeat the impending doom. Again, at chapter 20, verse 3, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, that's that all again, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O God of our fathers, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Jehoshaphat called the people to fast and pray. You know, we need to devote the time we spend on worry and fasting and praying. And we all know this. We all know that every mighty movement of God began with what? Prayer. Absolutely, prayer. So Jehoshaphat calls him to prayer. And he comes out and he says, God, kill these pagan heathens that are coming after us. No. In his prayer, if we look down at verse 6, he begins it with praise. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule all the kingdoms of the nation. In your hand are power and might, so that is none that is able to withstand you. He acknowledges his lordship, his power, his might. So when we're faced with impending doom, begin your prayer with praise. You are God and there is no other. We implore the divine first with praise. And next, he prays the promises of God. That's in verses 7 through 9. I'll read them for you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Pray the promises of God. Um, one of our former senior pastors, John Kitchen, at Stone Lines, um, prolific writer but he wrote a book called he is able which is basically taking that and praying those promises of god i suggest it if you're going through something if you're not uh it is a great book uh, to help with the promises of god pray the promises of god you know god's promises they're not like car warranties that run out and then god calls us every five minutes to the chance to extend them not going to happen his promises are ironclad, guaranteed, whether we feel them or not. He's unchangeable, and so are his promises. He wants us, he wants us to pray those promises back to him. So finally, after offering praise and pray, praying back the promises of God, Jehoshaphat gets to his petition now, and that's in verses 12. 10 through 12. Now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Do you know that fuzzy little ball on the back, on a spider's back? You realize that's not lint, right? That's an egg sac containing billions and billions and billions, 
maybe not, spiders. So if you listen to those folks who say, don't kill the spiders, they're helpful, that will come back to bite you, literally. That's what happens. This is what's happening to Israel. They're having a spider moment. God said, don't kill those people when you go into the land. And this is how they get repaid, is with them coming to destroy them. Jehoshaphat does not rant and rave at God. He does something that is difficult for a king, that is difficult for us. Jehoshaphat humbles himself during his petition. He says, for we are powerless. This is a guy with a one million man army. For we are powerless. You know, during this time of gender identity, racial tensions, the economy, politics, continual war, natural disasters, pastoral transition, and killer spiders, uh, we have to admit, right, we're powerless. Nobody has the answers except Jesus, right? Except Jesus. So we join with Jehoshaphat in saying, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Jehoshaphat makes his petition, surrenders the solution to God. You know, the most important thing of prayer that we so often look is listening. When we implore the divine, don't forget to listen. Look what happens next in uh, down now in verses 13 through 17 of chapter 20. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives and their children. And the spirit of the Lord came to Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite of the son of Asaph in the assembly, the mess, blah, blah, blah. In the midst of the assembly, you got his, uh, you know, what is that, me and 23 line up there, his whole, uh, his whole family line. Anyways, that gives him some authority. And he says, listen all Jude inhabitants of Jerusalem and, and uh, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. You know, the answer that came to, this, to the prophet was, and the first thing that he tells him in, in there in verse 15 is what? Listen. I got the word from the Lord. Listen. One of the hardest things in prayer. Listen. We're too busy pouring out our, our heart's troubles. We forget time to take the time to listen. God has the answers. Remember, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, and we should make it our ears too. You know, the next component with prayer is, is obedience. It does no good to listen if we don't follow what God tells us to do. He commands them, don't be afraid. God will deal with our fears. We don't have to worry and be anxious about him. He concludes this prophecy with the same reminder, don't be afraid. Then God gives them an action plan in verses 16 and 17. He tells them, go down, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord. You know, sometimes God says, move into your fears, doesn't he? Yeah. Move into them. Take the impending doom head on. Go, stand firm, 
and watch. But God, you know, what, what that good is that going to do? You don't understand the urgency of I'm facing right now, God. But the prophet said, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Let's let go. Let's let go and let him do it. It's not our fight, it's God's. We will never defeat our fears and find hope if we continue to insist on doing the fighting. The battle is God's. You know, it's, it's a great thing to have someone else fight your battles. Some years back, we were having a family dinner at our house, and, you know, I'm the grill master. So um, I was going to do some grilling, so I got into the kitchen drawer, and I, got, I have a favorite pair of tongs that I use. Now, I don't know, if, if you have a pair of tongs in your hand, um, it's almost a given that you have to pinch somebody with those tongs, right, before you go out to the grill. Sure, right? Isn't that it? So, um, it's a basic truth. So, Cindy's at the sink. I do have some sense of decorum. So, I just grabbed her shirt and tugged it a little bit with the tongs and then hit him behind my back and said, nothing to see here. To which she made some terrible remark about me never seeing anything again in my life. But my grandson, the youngest grandson who's four at the time, was standing there watching all this. And he asked me for the tongs. Now I ask you, how was I supposed to know what his intentions were, right? I mean, maybe he wants to help me grill. Well, he takes the tongs, opens them up full bore, and proceeds to get a good piece of his grandmother's backside. Then he quickly puts them behind his back and says, nothing to see here. But you know what? He's okay because he had someone's going to fight his battles. Guess where that's coming down to? Yeah, that's going on grandpa, not him. You know, he's safe. The battle's not ours. It's God's. It's God's. Stand and see the salvation he'll bring. You know, Nothing to see here. No, there is something to see here. He calls them out. Hey, come and watch and see. You know, the prophet concludes his message again with that promise. And the Lord will be with you. Jesus promised us that, didn't he? I will never leave nor forsake you. The battle is the Lord. How about we let him fight it? How about we get off Facebook and get on our faces and implore the divine to heal our nation, to heal our world, to heal our churches, and to heal our broken souls. You know, so what is Jehoshaphat's reaction to the prophet's message? We see that in verses 18 and 19. He says this, it says this, then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise God, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. This prayer is bookended by what? Praise. They begin with praise, they finish with praise. Praise God and know that he has taken care of our impending doom. When facing the fear of impending doom, we implore the divine and, and then we share in inheriting the deliverance because our eyes are on him. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on him, right? We continue in the account in verses 20. Uh, through 30 then. And it says, They rose early in the morning, went out into the wilderness of Tekoa, and when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, 
Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. And as they went before the army, uh, as they went before and say, give thanks to the Lord for a steadfast love endures forever. He gathers the people the next morning, reminds them to believe in God, to believe in prophets. And the first thing he does as they begin to move out is to worship. And not just any worship. This is full-on church worship that they're doing. And he doesn't put his strongest fighters out front. Jerry, he took the worship leaders and put them out front. You can sacrifice your worship leaders. They're expendable. So that's what you do. You put, well, no, that's not true. You put them out front. But isn't that a whole different definition of how you go to battle? They're in their Sunday finest, their holy attire, and they're leading the army. That's putting your faith in God. Verses 22 through 23 then says, When they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come, down, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. You know, just when they had started their praise choruses, God began their deliverance. True to his word, the people of Judah didn't have to fight. You know what? They didn't even make it to the battlefield until the game was over. The battle is the Lord's. God's caused confusion in the ranks, and they began to kill one another until none was left. You know, many times, God is already at work behind the scenes, bringing about our deliverance, and we don't even know it's happening. We just need to trust, obey, and praise. Now Judah comes to a high spot. I think they're on their 10th chorus of God you reign. And they view the whole battlefield now ahead of them. We'll pick it up in verse 24 and 25. When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the horde. And behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, and precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were three days in taking the spoils. It was so much. You know the cool thing about God? I think we're allowed to say cool, aren't we, about God? When we love and trust him, when we love and trust him, him he goes far beyond our expectations he lavishes us lavishes us with boundless grace he didn't just bring about deliverance he gave them unfathomable rewards it took them three days to pick everything up within god's deliverance are immeasurable blessings. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. But wait, there's more. The account doesn't end there because we see in verse 26 through 30. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Berica to this day. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. They came to Jerusalem with harps, lyres, and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet for his God gave him rest all around. So on that fourth day, they got together and they worshiped again. When we experience God's deliverance, 
we should be changed. Our hearts should be bursting with, with praise and blessing toward God. And it's not just an action of praise. It's an attitude of praise. We should be changed. And when the church service stopped there on that fourth day, the praise didn't stop. All the way back home, they continued in praise, eventually coming to the house of the Lord and culminating their worship. So what happened to their fears? Well, we see in those verses, it went where? To all the surrounding countries. Wasn't the fear of Jehoshaphat and his army. It wasn't any alliance that he made that made them fearful. It was the fear of the God, fear of God, because they knew it was the Lord who was fighting for Judah. Do you notice we've come full circle in this story? We began chapter 17, verse 10, and it said, And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, and they made no war against Jehoshaphat. Compare that to 29 and 30 of chapter 20. And the fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. The fear of God is once again on the nations. There was rest all around. There was peace. Isn't that what we're seeking We want rest and peace. You know, just just like our homes and life, there will always be spiders lurking. There will always be webs to get entangled in. You know, the Apostle Paul warned us in 2 Timothy 2.4, said, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. We need to be doing kingdom work. That's why God enlisted us. Do the work of the Lord and ultimately please our Savior. He's fighting our battles. Whatever fears you're dealing with, God is there fighting your battles. When faced with impending doom, implore the divine and inherit the deliverance. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the fact, Lord, that even at times that we feel it so much, um, that we're alone in this, that there is no help, there is no hope, there's just doom. Lord, you're already in the battle. You're already ahead of us fighting it. You're already making straight our paths. Thank you, Lord pray now for each one of us. You give us the confidence, the hope to stay in the game, to stay in the battle, to stand and watch you, Lord. Not to take it on ourselves, but to rest in you. Thank you, Lord, for those times when we don't know what to do, when we are powerless but our eyes remain upon you. Thank you, Jesus.